Hey guys, what's up? This is Vinnie Stevens here and welcome to another video for my channel and welcome to uh, another vinyl review. Um, unfortunately, the last one. Uh, so in this video, we will be reviewing BAM! U2, the unforgettable fire. So enough of me talking. Uh, let's get on with the video. So, who are you two? Um, so, you two are an Irish rock band that formed in Dublin, Ireland in 1976 and are still active today. Uh, the band consists of Bono as lead vocals and rhythm guitar, The Edge on lead guitar, keyboard and banging vocals, Adam Clowden on bass guitar, and Larry Mullen Jr. on drums and percussion. Uh, the genres they play are rock, tonal rock, and post punk. The band have released 14 studio albums, one live album, three compilations, 15 video albums, uh, 72 music videos, 8 EPs, and 84 singles. The band's musical style has evolved throughout their career and yet has maintained an horrific quality built on Bono's expressive vocals and the edge effective bass guitar textures. Um, their lyrics offer embraced em with spiritual imagery, focus on personal and social political themes. Popular for their live performances, the group has staged several vigorous and elaborate, I have no idea how to say that, tours over the course of their career. Now on to about the album. So background of about the al album, sorry, uh, Not Very Gettable Fire is the fourth studio album released by U2. It was produced by Brian Eno and Dino Londos and was released on the 1st of October 1984 by Island Records. In this album, the band wanted to pursue a new musical direction from their previous album, War, released in 1983, which was more of a hard-hitting rock. The producer, Eno and Londos, um, to produce an assistant, experimentation and more ambient and abstract sound. Um, the change in direction was at the time the band's most erratic shift. Uh, the title on the artwork cover um, of the album is refer reference to the atomic bomb in the Fimushima. The band began recording the, in the May 1984 at Slane Castle in Burnham Valley in County Myth in Ireland. Uh, this is where the band lived, wrote and recorded to find new inspiration. The album was completed in August 1984 at Windmill Lower Lane Studio. It featured an atmospheric sound and lyrics that led vocalist bon Bonner described for Pride in the Name of Love and M M K M L K or lyrical tributes to Martin Luther King Jr. The album is received favourable by critics from uh, and produced the band's biggest hits of all time. The, this album has been received generally favourable reviews uh, from critics and at the time produced the biggest hit, uh, Pride in the Name of Love, as well as Le Life Favourable's Bad, which was about a song about addiction to heroin. So now on to background. So, background of the album. So, the band had feared following their 1983 war album and after the war tour that they were heading a direction becoming more of a slayer, sugaring arena rock band uh, following a show at uh, Dublin Phoenix Park race course in, 1983, in August 1983. It was one of the final days of the war tour. Uh, Bono Bono spoke about the band breaking up and reforming with a different direction. Um, in late 1983, after finishing the war tour with shows in Japan, rehearsals rehearsed in Bono's seaside hometown in Bay County, Wicklow. Uh, during, during, uh, during this time, the songs Pride in the Name of Love, The Unforgettable Fire and Sort of Homecoming were intentionally composed. Uh, U2 had recorded the first three albums at Windmill Lane Studios, 
but decided to find a new location for the next studio album. Uh, Cl Clyden um, uh, limited that the lack of live room at Windmill Studio in which the band could play together. With the band's manager Paul McGuinness uh, said that the studio had barely enough space for people to work. McGuinness said finding a new location came up with Church Hall in, Ren in Renglef. I have no idea how to say that. Uh, but he, he found that it was overpriced. Uh, the band tour manager Dennis Sherman um, also searched for suitable locations and found Slane Castle in County Myth. Um, the building's owner, Lord Henry Mount Charles, offered to lease it to the group for less than half the cost of Church Hall and all offered lodging and to feed the band and crew from the restaurant on premises. The castle's Gothic ballroom, which was originally built for music and had a 30 foot high doomed ceiling, also attracted the band as they were looking to catch all national acoustics of the room in their recordings. The band had recorded the first three albums with producer Steve Lily White, um, and rather than creating the Son of War, they sought experimentation. Uh, both Lily Wright and the group agreed that it was time to change of producer and should not repeat the same formula. The, big, the band considered Jimmy Ivon, uh, who had produced a live album under the Blood Red Sky, this live album, the year prior, but they have found that the early musical ideas for the new album to be too European for American producer. U2 instead had turned to their attention to Harry music musician producer uh, Brian Eno, guitarist uh, the Edge had long admired Eno's music, particularly Head. Uh, however, Eno was hesitant to work with a rock band, and when contacted by U2, he told them he was considered retired from music production to become a video artist. Um, Eno eventually did agree to meet with the band and brought along his engineer Daniel Arnos, not Lonos, um, with the intention of recommending he work with them instead. Lonos had his own ambitions of producing a rock band. Uh, Eno and Lonos agreed to produce the record with understanding that if Eno's work in relationship with U2 was not fruitful, they would have a solid producer with Lonos on which they could fall back. Island, Island Records boss Chris Blackwell internally tried to talk to U2 of Harry and Anno, believing that when they were about to achieve the highest level of success, uh, Anno would bury them on their layer of, uh, of average grade nonsense. Next year, also of Ireland Records thought the band were too mad. Um, Blackwell insisted him to dislude U2 from working with Anno. Stuart recalled Blackwell telling them, you better sort your band out because they're going to be a very, they're going in a very odd direction. Uh, Stuart was unable to change their minds permanently. Blackwell to fly to London to meet with the group. Ultimately, he convinced that Bono's per persistence and the band's refusal album for collaboration. Just in hindsight, the group's decision to stretch themselves to find an extra dimension because of the turning point in their career. Uh, now on to recording and production. So, uh, back around, uh, recording and production. Uh, the band arrived at Slane Castle on the 7th of May 1984 for a month long recording session. A makeshift control room was set up in the drawing room and, um, by Arrange's company, Enralph Music, which recorded due to his concert in. Boston and at the Red Rocks Amphitheatre the previous year. Uh, they were hired um, to provide a then unique portable 24 track recording system. Um, a grand equipment was set up in the Castle Library, dubbed the Chinese Room, uh, with cables running into a Justin's ballroom where the band played. The band and crew lived at the castle during the sessions, helping to foster um, commemorative among them. The site provided a relaxed and experimental atmosphere. Uh, U2 walked long days at the castle, sometimes from 10am to 1am. Um, 
I know was worked on a more executive schedule um, than other members of the creative team and was focused on creative ideas and conceptual aspects while Landis uh, handled the production of Juicy. In Billy, Gra- in Billy Graham's words, Anu Tax was to help you to mature a new, more ex- experimental and European musical vocabulary. Um, Anu was glad, was glad that the group began the sessions with only rough sketches of songs. He was more interested in encouraging experimentation and improvising than referring to their, their ideas. To the end, he often created an atmosphere because of a synthesizer that was intended to inspire you two in London to play play along. The band's experiments produced 15 additional pieces of music. Um, he, he, produced, his, he, producer, encouraged you two to work on their more unconventional material, uh, comparison songs that you two seemed very you, you two ish or, or things that something began the clear the 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 I can't say that. Um, as a result, he did take much interest in songs like "Pride in the Name of Love" uh, or "The Unforgettable for Fire." However, Londres would cover for him such as two bands each other out. The band finished recordings at Slay Castle on the fifth of June and began the second phase of recording session at Windmill Lane Studio the following day. The original intent was to record backing tracks at Slane before we're done with mixing at Windmill Studio. So on to composition. I forgot to say there as part of the recording. So 12 days before the deadline to complete the album, uh, Bono had told his bandmates he did not think he was able to finish the lyrics in time, which this kind of created a panic. Uh, McGinnis remi- re- re- reminded the group of their commit committed to tour uh, Australia and New Zealand less than a month. And the producer in the studio would have to would not be available afterwards um, to complete the album. The band worked twenty hours days for the final two weeks. Eno worked the first half of the days while to oversee the final mixes. After the band completed the album at seven a.m. On the 5th of August, their final day in the studio, Londres flew to London to master it in the basement of Blackwell's offices. So, composition. So, this was a far more atmospheric album than the previous war album. The Unforgettable Fire was at the time the band's most dramatic change in direction. It had a rich and orchestrated sound and was the first yeah, sorry, E.T. album with a conservative sound. Under Lonis's direction, you know, Larry's drumming became loosier, funkier and more stable and Adam's bass became more familiar, such as the rhythm section no longer interacted but falling in support of the songs. The opening track of Sort of Homecoming immediately shows that the, the change of E.T. sound uh, like much of the album, a hard hidden material drum sound of war is replaced with a more polyrhythmic shuffle, and the guitar is no longer promoted into the in the mix. Typically, the album, the track "The Unforgettable Fire" with a string arrangement, but Noel Kean had a rich, uh, symphonic sound built with and a minute guitar and driven rhythm along with. Lyrical sketch that emotional travel look with a heartfelt sense of yearning. The album's lyrics are open to many interpretations, which, alongside its atmospheric sound, provides what the band often call a very visual fear. Uh, the melody of the chorus to Pride in the Name of Love originally came out on, on the 1983 uh, uh, war. Tour sound check in Hawaii. The band originally intended to be about Ronald Reagan's pride in American military power at the time, but Bono was more influenced by Stephen B. Oates' book, Martin for King Jr., titled Let's Triumph the Sound, the Life of Martin Luther King Jr., and the biography of Malcolm X to ponder the different sides of the civil rights campaign. The violent, the violent, 
um, non-violent Bono would revise the lyrics to pay tribute to King Pride uh, when through many changes and re-recordings. Um, Pride is also the most confidential uh, song on the album. Tony Fanciara of Jammin magazine said at the time it was the most commercial song you 2 had written and it was chosen as the band's first single. And while Bono tried to convey his um, ambivalence to drugs, uh, it is fast-paced song built on the light funk drum groove. Um, the band showed the influence of Talking Heads with whom Emo had worked. Uh, much of the song was Im improvised by Bono at the microphone. Um, that that opening instrumental, 4th of July, came almost entirely for the moment and of inspiration from Anu. Bono tried to describe the the rush and calm down of heroin use in the song Bad. Um, Elvis Presley in America is an infra uh, imp I cannot say that. I'm just going to say based on the slow down back track of A Sort of Homecoming. That takes the album's emphasis on feeling over clarity to the furthest extreme. Another song, Indian Summer Sky, was a social commentary on the prison like atmosphere in the city. Rather than living of national forces, the spare dream like Melt was written in the Emily to King. So now on to recording and production. So, release and promotion. So, The Unforgettable Fire was released on, as I said, on the 1st of October 1984. The band took its name as much as an inspiration from the travelling expedition of paintings and drawings at the Peace Museum in Chicago with the survivor of the atomic bombs of, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan uh, during World War, the end of World War II. Uh, the Pride in the Name of Love was released as the album's lead single on September 1984. It was at the point of the band's biggest hit. It cracked UK number top five and the US's top 40. It would ultimately become the group's most frequent played songs in concert. And I could tell it's a good song live. Uh, the Unforgettable Fire was released as uh, the second single in April 1985, the song became the band's top 10 hit in the UK, reaching number 6 on the UK singles chart, number 8 in the Dutch singles chart, but did not perform well in the US. So now on to Critical Reputation. So Critical Reputation, so I want to do this different than what I've done in the past, uh, where I just read stuff out from different things, uh, from different people, from different whatever. So I'm just doing the professional ratings and the, their review score. So all music rated it a four out of five. The Austrian Chronicle, um, four and a half out of five. Chicago Trombone, um, three out of three and a half out of four. Entertainment Weekly was a B plus. Hot Press, uh, 12 out of 12. Pitchfork, 9.3 out of 10. Q, 10, 5 stars. Rolling Stones, 3 stars. Uh, Rolling Stones Album Guide, uh, 4.5. And, and The Village Voice, B+. Plus. Now on to Tour and Live Aid. So, Tour and uh, Live Aid. So, The Unforgettable Fire Tour, which was the obviously the tour to support this album, started on the 29th of August 1984 and ended on the 25th of July 1985. It had six legs on 112 shows. Um, the first leg was Oceania, so Australia and New Zealand, from the 29th of August to the 24th of September 1984. The second leg was Europe, which Contain which tour countries such as France, Belgium, Netherlands, England, Scotland, and then West Germany. The tour started in France um, on the 18th of October and to the 21st of November and ended in West Germany. The third leg uh, was North America, the US, the US, and Canada. It started in Upper Derby and ended in Long Beach. 
1985, the four flags started in Europe. The tour went to Norway, Sweden, West Germany, at least Switzerland and France. It started on the 23rd of January and ended on the 10th of February. The fifth leg of the tour was North America again, the US and Canada, starting on the 25th of February and ended on the 4th of May. And the last leg was the European Summer Festivals. So they toured uh, West Germany, Switzerland, England, Ireland and Belgium. It started on the 25th of May and ended on the 25th of July. So you two participated in a live via benefit concert at Wembley Stadium for the Ethiopian Open Famine Relief in July 1985. U2's performance was one of the show's most memorable, joining a 12-minute performance of song Bad. Bono leapt down off the stage to embrace and dance with a fan. The length of the song performance was cut their set short by a song intentionally thinking they were blowing it. In fact, it was a breakthrough moment for the band, showing a television audience of millions the personal connection that Bono could make with the audience. All U2's previous albums um, went back on the charts in the UK after that performance. In 1985, Rolling Stones magazine called U2 the band of the 80s, showing for a growing number of rock and roll fans. Uh, U2 have become the band's matters most, uh, even the only band that matters. Um, so now you're on two track listings. So track listings. So on side one was Sort of Uncommon, Pride in the Name of Love, Wired, The Unforgettable Fire and Promenade. Uh, side two was 4th of July, Bad, Indian Summer Sky, Elvis Presley in America, and Milk MLK. So now on two charts. So charts. Um, so the weekly chart performance for this album in Australia and New Zealand, it peaked at number one. The Canadian album chart, it reached number five. Um, the weekly chart performances uh, Norway, Norway, Sweden, I went to number six, Portuguese 27, um, UK albums chart number one, and the US Billboard 200 number 12. Um, the weekly chart performance for the singles, uh, Pride in the Name of Love, it went number two in Ireland and the US. Um, uh, 27 in Canada, 5 in New Zealand, number, no, Netherlands, sorry, number 1 in New Zealand, number two, uh, number 33 in the US Hot 100, uh, The Unforgettable Fire went to number 1 um, in Ireland, number 4 in New Zealand, in Netherlands, uh, number 3 in New Zealand, and number 6 in the UK, the, the, Two US main charts in Canada and top. Um, 1984's Wire, it only went to number 31 in the US main rock. And 1985, it was number 19, Bad, it was number 19 on the US main rock thing. So now I want to certification. So certification, so sales certification for this album in Canada, it's went three times platinum, selling over 300,000 copies. France, the SNEP, it went gold, selling 100,000 copies. Netherlands, it went gold, 50,000. New Zealand, platinum, 15,000. Uh, Switzerland, gold, 25,000. UK, it went two times platinum, 600,000. And the US, it went three times Times Platinum sound over 3 million copies. Now on to cover. So the album cover, let's put the light up there. Uh, get it. So, okay, I'll take, take a light of its uh, section. Um, so, this is the album cover. Uh, you see, you've got the Bad name and the stuff at the top. 
Uh, so this photograph is um, Mondome Castle in Mondome in County Westmeath in Ireland near Afflone. Uh, it, it is a ruined castle. It was built in 1812 and was used from 1814 to 1924. It was designed by Richard Morrison and then it was set light on the 4th of July 1921 by the IRA. Um, the photographer Anton Corbin photographed it for this album um, and, and gave it a speck of tone. Uh, the for, the for, photograph, however, was a virtual copy of the picture on the cover of a 1980 book in ruins, The Once Great Houses of Ireland by Simon Marsden. Um, Mark Marsden, sorry, for which you two have played play a conversation. It was taken from the same spot and used the same poor list filter technique, but with addition of the four band members. So obviously got that at the front and then at the back there's a small uh, photo. Um, it's got side one, side two, and the lyrics to um, the sort of homecoming song. Inside, again, you've got the photo of the band and at the back is just an unforgettable fire and people who were um, involved with making the album obviously covers ripped at the bottom. So now on to my review. So my review of the album, I rate this album a 9 out of 10. This is a brilliant album, uh, probably one of my favourite U2 albums and yeah, obviously it's one of their best albums, a second best album, like they brought out after their next album, 1987's Joshua Tree, uh, in the 80s. Um, like, I think as like their war, their previous album, as like their breakthrough album, but this album kind of um, has a, its own, like, they have their own signature sound. Uh, to it. it's a bit like for example about like Queen Sheer Hard Attack. That was our break free album, but now the opera is where they got their signature sound from. Um like um this album has some great songs on it that I got into the after listening to like the Joshua Tree album. Um uh, I'm so yeah, so where I got this album from, I brought this from tunes uh, where I previously got load of albums from I think it was in the Easter of 2018 which was just before I moved over here um, I decided to be just go um, get it one day because I wanted another uh, U2 album in in my collection and the sort of homecoming uh, was kind of one of those albums that I'd listened to, like, I think I listened to some of the songs on it before and wanted to um, buy the album and listen to it in full. Uh, I, I didn't, I did have it on a lot uh, when I first got it. I did put it on the odd time. I know, like, obviously, uh, I have seen you two live back in 2017 at Twickenham Stadium uh, in London. Um, this is where I saw them live for the first time. Uh, they played the Joshua Tree in full. Uh, I think another song they did actually off this album was Pride in the Name of Love, like at the start. And that's like, that song was unreal. Uh, live, I think they finished off with Bad or it may have been one, I'm not too sure. Uh, obviously, as well, um, uh, being you two coming from the Ireland of Ireland, they are an influence on me in some way, and I kind of, I kind of, uh, God, they are. Uh, well, like, I was due to go and see them there on their like, last tour, but obviously, I had moved over here at the time. Um, and also, uh, 
uh, in this year, 2019, when this video is being released, um, Bono actually played in my hometown with uh, uh, Snow Patrol, which pretty much I heard it from my house, from my house, and it was quite. Even though I wasn't actually there at the concert, hearing it uh, was was something else. But anyway, I'm going to wrap this video up. So guys, hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. This was kind of a cover up to the mini series I've done on vinyl reviews. Uh, I was, I kind of haven't been able to do a full series because. I'm a student and I don't have a lot of money to go out and like buy vinyls. Um, so yeah, I have got one or two um, specials uh, in the pipeline, so stay tuned to that. I will probably do other things with the vinyls, uh, to try and keep this like vinyl review series thing going, but. I've also new things in the work staff plant. So yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Hit the instant notifications bell in the description below. Um, obviously, I should I forgot to say there as well. There was a lot of uh, research I did into this uh, vinyl, but not all of it went into it because um, I wanted to keep it as short as possible. But anyway, thanks for watching. See